Getting paid not to be afraid. What is up, house stackers? Welcome to episode number 13 of the Stacking Houses podcast, where we're helping working professionals create a solid plan B, a side hustle of passive streams of income through real estate investing. I'm your host, Damon Santa Maria, and my goal for each show is to provide you with some practical and inspiring information so that you too can create a solid financial plan for yourself. So to help you on your journey, I want to give you a free copy of my book entitled How to Acquire Your First 10 Investment Properties. And you can pick this up simply by going to stackinghouses.com forward slash book. And while you're there, you can check out our free training on where Jim and I are finding great deals in today's landscape. So for today's episode, I interview James Ledbetter, who is a normal person just like you and I but he slowly and persistently built his portfolio to 12 properties. James has a real unique perspective on out-of-town properties and how to manage them. Additionally, he provides some great advice for newer investors just getting started. So without further ado, here's the interview with James Ledbetter. It's my pleasure to welcome James Ledbetter to the show. James, how are you today? Hey, I'm I'm great. Uh, happy Happy Monday. Yeah. So we met on Bigger Pockets. I think it was about six months ago, and I think you sent me a message to, to connect, and we had a follow up discussion. And what was really intriguing uh, to me was your investment style and your hands on approach to managing your own properties, which we'll get into here in just a moment. But you know, let's first discuss you know your current profession and. Also, how you got into real estate investing in the first place? Sure, sure. Um, I, I think n- not to overstate the obvious, but I'm I'm just a regular guy, um, just a, a, a father, um, a husband, uh, and uh, and I just happened to have a real passion for real estate. Didn't know that I had that uh, passion, uh, but as it turns out, I, I love it. I love the challenges, all of that. Um, I've, I've got a, uh, thankfully, feel blessed, I've got a uh, day job as a compliance officer for a global bank, and uh, that certainly keeps me busy. Um, but thankfully, I've been able to um, juggle real estate and, and juggle all the responsibilities that all of us have as, as adults and bring my real estate, um, passion along and, and not have to abandon it, uh, uh, at the roadside. So I've got a full-time job, but I've been, uh, uh, a real estate investor for a number of years. Okay. And tell us, uh, you know, walk us through your, your first deal, how you got into it, and, you know, maybe some of the uh, things that attracted you to even, you know, wanting to dabble in real estate investing. Sure. Um, you know, some people, uh, and, and I'm envious of these people, Damon, you know, they know they want to be fill in the blank from when they were a little boy or a little girl. Um, that certainly wasn't me. I, I felt like I could enjoy um spending my time doing a lot of different things so way back in 1996 (laughs) and i had to do the math i was uh 27 years old at the time um uh living at home um doing uh i I was working but living at home thankfully uh had had a great relationship with my father so uh bunking at home wasn't a problem uh But at that time, uh, I noticed four doors down from my father's house, um, a house came up for sale. And it was about, uh, gosh, 850 square feet. And I asked myself the question, I wonder if I could buy that house just a few doors down from the house that I grew up in as a teenager. And and where did you grow up? In, in uh, Central Texas, in Round Rock, Texas. So that's my old stomping ground. That's where I spent my teen years. And I thought, well, um, I, I like um, 
I like this Round Rock area. It's 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 the area that I know. And here's this little uh, house owned owned by an elderly woman, and I guess she needs to sell. And I think the sales price, Damon, was around sixty thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> And if we I could only go back in time and, you know, buy, you know, 20 of those properties. Oh, for most certainly. <laughs> it, yeah. And so I thought, OK, uh, I don't know much about um, getting a mortgage or anything like that. Uh, although I think at the time I might have been working at a mortgage company. So I had some awareness, but had never, uh, you know, applied for a mortgage or something like that. So I didn't let my uh, lack of knowledge stop me. I just thought, hey, what's step one? I guess I need to talk to a loan officer. And I did that. And it led to me getting uh, pre-qualified for a loan. And then I thought, okay, I guess I need to call this uh, realtor that's listing the house and say, can you help me make an offer? So we did that. My offer got accepted. Um, I don't remember if I made a full full price offer or what, uh, but it got accepted and I got uh, a loan, a mortgage loan and moved into the property. And so I was a bachelor um, and I had my first property at age 27. And now, it was pretty cool. Sorry to interrupt, but when, when you first had this idea of, of buying the property was it with the intention of you know it being your primary residence or were you already thinking hey i could rent this out and and make some money i i i think it would be uh you know hard to say what i was thinking when i was 27 but i'm pretty sure it was just like hey i can't live at home forever right um and so i better i better act like a a responsible young man and I better get my own pad. So I think that was as far as my thought process went and I moved in and, um, and I thought, Hey, this is great. I may need to buy a bed. I may need to buy a washer and dryer, you know, those kinds of things. So early on, um, having it as a rental was, uh, so, you know, I think that would have been absurd thinking to me. Now, over a couple of years, as time went on, and I realized, you know, owning this house wasn't too burdensome. And I think back at that time, I realized, hey, I could do the simple math and realize if I were renting an apartment somewhere, um, what would I be paying for that? And I think even back then, not even remembering what rates were, they were certainly higher. I realized hey, I've actually got my own space, got my own yard, tiny little yard, and I'm not uh, having to pay rent at an apartment. So I did make that connection, but it certainly, I didn't buy the house thinking, uh, boy, I can't wait till I can rent this out. Okay. So so fast forward, you know, you've got this house and, um, you know, what what are your next steps there? How do you transition that house from being your primary residence to it becoming an investment property? Sure. Um, in the, uh, there's a nearby town near Round Rock, Texas called Georgetown, Texas, 10 minutes north. And um, I had a high school friend uh, that was, uh, that was living in that neighboring town and I believe at the time uh, he was doing some real estate uh, ventures, buying, uh, buying properties, buying lots and, and uh, building houses on them. And so in, in a few casual conversations with him, I think he said, hey, um, you know, there's houses for sale up here in Georgetown, again, 10, 10 miles north. Um, you ought to think about the idea of buying another property. And so I think over time that sunk in. And of course, I had no appreciable understanding of how would I do that? Right. I already have a mortgage. 
Uh, I'm, I've got a day job, but I'm certainly not rich. Uh, but again, that lack of, of know-how didn't stop me. So I thought, could I buy a house 10 miles north of where I live? And rather than sell this house that I've enjoyed as a bachelor, could I actually rent it out? And I asked that question. I think I had heard and done a little research. Oh, other people have done this successfully. And I knew, you know, um, asking the question was one thing. Figuring out how to do it was a different thing. But I thought, I've got the time to, to get answers to my questions. So every realtor I spoke to about another house 10 miles you know, north of where I was living, I always said, hey, uh, if you help me write an offer on this, uh, if I find a house in Georgetown, uh, can I, you know, how can I buy a second house and keep my house that I'm in now? And so I, I realized, okay, it looks like I could pull this off, get a second mortgage, show that I'm going to rent the house that I'm in now. And with that kind of evidence trial trail, I could buy a second house and not have to sell the first one. Right. And pull that off. And uh, so I bought a second property within 10 miles of the house that I was living in and then quickly realized, oh, I've, I've got to get this house on the market and find a tenant. Yeah. You know, this is what the mortgage, uh, uh, you know, they're going to require this, that I show a lease signed to pull this off. So uh, sometimes I was skipping steps, but then realizing, oh, I've got to do A, B, and C to make this feasible. Right. So, so take us through that process of, you know, finding a tenant, placing a tenant, getting them, you know, make sure that they're qualified and, you know, all that, that good stuff. And, and did you, were you at that point, even thinking about outsourcing this function in the form of, hey, maybe I'll call an agent or a property manager and have them help me? Or was you, was it just, hey, I, I just need to go, you know, find a tenant and go put an ad in I the newspaper? I think it was more of the latter. I think yeah. it was more of the latter. Hey, I just need to go and find a tenant. How do I do that? And this will make you laugh because I just remember this. I still have the sign, <laughs> the metal sign from about 25 years ago that I hammered in the front yard and I think it said house for sale, um, uh, two bedroom, one bath house it, with my phone number on it. So I did not reach out to a realtor and say, are you able to help me find somebody to rent this house? Right. I made my own sign. And, uh, and I think I took an ad out in the paper, the local paper. Yeah. Say, uh, sorry, uh, saying, yeah, house for rent, oh. house for rent. And I think I just picked a, um, you know, I didn't do any analytics. I'm not very analytically inclined, but I thought, I wonder if I could get $700 rent for my little tiny house. I knew what I was paying mortgage wise. So maybe that helped me. Okay. Right. Maybe I'll charge around that same rate and see if I can find a tenant. And I think my first tenant was somebody just driving by and they saw the sign and they said, do you, you know, they called and said, do you own this house? And I said, yes. Uh, okay. Can we look at it? Uh, sure. And I showed it to him and, uh, and then I, I think I uh, panicked and thought, oh gosh, uh, sounds like they want to rent this house. I need to, I think there's something called a lease that I need to sign <laughs> with someone. <laughs> so there was no vetting da Damon whatsoever. Right. There was no, how are, is this potential tenant credit worthy enough to pay me, um, uh, 
you know, responsibly month in and month out. There was none of that. It's like, oh, you'd like to rent my house. Let's do this. Uh, here's a key. Here's, here's something I think you need to sign. I think it's a lease agreement. I think I printed something off that I just found. And I didn't worry about legalese right. or any vetting of the tenant. So it, it sounds like, you know, in hindsight, you, you probably made, uh, you probably, there was probably several learning lessons along the way with this first deal. You know, number one, you, you didn't do really any analytics on, you know, if I charge $700 in rent, then, you know, maybe I'll, I'll have some cash flow. Maybe I won't. I just know what my, my mortgage is. Um, right. You know, you, you didn't have any uh, official, you know, lease documentation or something written up by an attorney or even, you know, the state of Texas that outlines a residential, you know, lease agreement. And then, you know, the person that you found, you know, no background check, you just kind of sounds like you, you went on a gentleman handshake and, you know, here's, here's the key and, you know, call me if you, if anything breaks type of thing, right? Yes, with, without question. I mean, that was truly it. And, and that re reveals a lot about me that, uh, you know, even though I've been able to pursue this and, and I guess uh, accumulate some rentals, um, I didn't let my just, um, I'm, I'm certainly not very analytical. I'm just not wired that way. Uh, I'm jealous of people that are that, that, um, you know, so I, I guess in some respects, you don't have to fit the mold. Uh, you don't have to become something that you aren't to maybe pursue real estate and maybe enjoy some successes. Uh, because uh, if I had looked at myself and said, well, James, you, you really don't know much. I'd have to admit, yes, I don't know much. And are you sure, uh, you know, what, what if this all goes wrong? Uh, and it certainly could have. And I, to, to, as, as you said, I certainly learned a lot of lessons, but uh, I kept getting back up um, and kept with it. And for some reason, I enjoyed it. Um, even the very, the very lows, um, I, I, I enjoyed it enough instinctively to stick with it, despite my uh, errors and mistakes along the way. Um, I just, I just ventured on. And, and so I, I then woke up one day and realized, okay, I'm now renting my house out uh, 10 miles from where I live now. Now I have two mortgages and one of my properties has a tenant. So I thought, hey, that's, um, I, did, I certainly didn't set the bar very high for success. And so I thought, hey, maybe this is some level of success. Well, that's, that's you know, interesting. It, it, you know, it mirrors closely my first property in that I didn't know what I was doing. And it was just figure it out along the way. And you know, the, the great thing about real estate is, um, you know, when you have time on your side and you have common sense and you have um, an internal um, intrinsic drive to succeed, you know, a lot of things can play out in your favor. Um, so let's fast forward and, and talk to us, you know, how you began to expand your portfolio. What are the next couple of deals you started looking at and where are they located as well? Sure, sure. So, um, like I said, my, my current state at that time was, Hey, now I have two properties. Um, and I'm, I'm renting out my very first property that I purchased, you know, four doors down from the house that I grew up in. And I, I think at that time I realized, um, you know, maybe I won't ever have to sell, um, this, this, uh, a property. And so now with two properties under my belt and that same friend doing real estate around the area, he was buying property, buying lots and building houses. Um, I thought, uh, hey, maybe I can keep this real estate game going. Uh, to fast forward, um, I uh, 
uh, met my soulmate around that same time, which was uh, uh, best, best, best blessing, best gift, uh, bar none. And um, we, 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 we uh, got engaged, got married. She realized, oh, so you have these two properties, yes. And it uh, sounds like you kind of have a, um, a passion for it. And yes, but I continue to work. You know, we all have bills to pay. And, and uh, I was, um, thankfully, the, my, my job career path in some ways paralleled the real estate business. It's not like I was uh, in a business that was so different from real estate. I worked for a mortgage company. I was a loan officer for a little bit because I had a, my younger brother got into that. Uh, I tried my hand at loan processing. Um, always wondered if I could be a loan underwriter, those kinds of things. So I was in a, a similar business and I, I was learning, okay, uh, so this is how loans get done. And, and I actually worked for a a real estate, a, a, uh, how a home builder okay. in the Austin area on, uh, part of their compliance team. And so uh, it was kind of a parallel similarities and, uh, thankfully, but, um, long story short, I lost my job in central Texas and, you know, panic set in. I thought, well, I've got to start sending my resume out and, and uh, you know, getting interviews and all of that because I am newly married and um, I had no money tree seeds that I could plant. And so we, we knew we needed, even though we were li living very meagerly, uh, we, we knew I needed a job, a day job. And, and uh, so I ended up taking a job here in North Texas, Dallas, in the okay. Dallas greater area. So we moved from Central Texas up here. Okay. Uh, landed up here, stayed in an apartment, tried to learn the area. And uh, when we got up here, it was with the intention that, okay, um, can I buy a house up here? And can I now rent out this second property that we have in central texas right and so i just kept i just kept with that model uh talking to uh, loan officers asking them hey how do i make myself look good enough on paper so that i don't have to sell these properties i can keep them keep them as rentals and yet buy another house and so um I thought if I could do it with two properties, I could maybe keep going, yeah. right? Just keep, yeah. keep going. Okay. Exactly. So we, we moved up here to Dallas and over the past decade, uh, decade plus, um, I have tried to no, no real formula, you know, like I'm going to try to buy one property a year or two properties a year or something like that. It's like, hey, I'm not going to forget that I enjoy real estate. Sure. So if there is a time when I realize, I think, I think we could take on another property, I've tried to scrape together enough money to put 20% down so I could get another loan. Okay. And so, so today, what does your portfolio look like? How many properties got, do you have? Sure. I've got 12 properties in total, Damon, um, and uh, one, one there in, in Central Texas, that first property, still have that. That's actually being used as a business rental now. Uh, over the decades, all the properties in Round Rock, Texas, downtown Round Rock, Texas have uh, become, uh, you know, zoning has changed. Yeah, for commercial. So, I, yes, I have a commercial lease agreement, which is great, which I've had for about 10 years now. Never thought uh, that would happen and come to fruition, but it did. And so have that property in Central Texas, one there, 
six single family residences here in North Texas, two in San Antonio, two in the Colleen area. Okay. And now uh, my most recent purchase uh, bought a property in East Texas and uh, with the goal of changing the zoning of this property that I purchased in East Texas, uh, hopefully I can change it to business use and replicate what I did 25 years ago in Round Rock, Texas. I, it'd be great if I could find another um, quiet business to, to rent this East Texas property. So how did, how, how did you find this? That's uh, suitable for a business. Yeah. How did you find the East Texas property? Um, just uh, no, no clever way. Uh, I'll spend sometimes in, in the evenings on Google, on all, on Zillow, looking at all the listings on several different sites. So it was certainly just a, a listing. You know, it was on the MLS and um, I thought, hey, I'll, I'll call the listing agent and say, could you, I, I think you have a listing, is it still available? Knowing full well that she could say, hey, James, there's 10 offers on this house sure. all for, you know, over asking price. Right. Uh, but she said, no, it's, it's available. I said, great, let me uh, write an offer. And, and we did. And she said, the, uh, you know, three or four days later, she said, the sellers have accepted your uh, full price offer. And I realized, oh my gosh, I just bought my first property in East Texas. Yeah. And, and uh, right now, Damon, I'm, I'm, uh, I've already had one meeting with the city uh, of Kilgore, Texas, which is kind of in between Longview and Tyler. Sure. About, hey, can I please change the zoning from residential to business use? The verdict is still out on whether or not I'll be able to do that. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's awesome, James. Um, you know, and as you know, many of my listeners already know, you know, most all of my properties are out of town, actually out of state. And now I've got a team of professional property managers that I lean on to help me out. Tell us, you know, how are you managing all of these properties? Do you have property managers or are you just kind of doing them yourself? <laughs> Well, um, you know, uh, I guess if I were uh, smart enough, I would use a management company. But in keeping with my very unorthodox approach, I manage all my properties, Damon, myself. And I'm not handy in the least bit. Um, I, I could change a light bulb. I've done a, I've done a garbage disposal um, I've done those kinds of things, but gosh, I've, I've, uh, I'm not very handy at all. And yet I manage my own properties. Sounds unthinkable, but what I've done over the years is just, uh, communicate to, uh, my tenants to say, Hey, I don't mind if you call me in the middle of the night with an emergency sure. over, over, um, the past decade. That really hasn't uh, happened all that much. So I haven't let that, well, you mean, you know, if, if, if my wife said, well, James, what if you get a call in the middle of the night? And I said, well, I guess I'll get up and uh, rub the sleep out of my eyes and, and uh, ask my tenant what's going on. Sure. Uh, thankfully, there haven't been those occurring on a regular basis. They certainly could. But, but again, I didn't let that fear. And so when my tenant calls me, if, if a tenant calls me and says, James, we've got water spewing, uh, you know, broken pipe or whatever, and I've had all those circumstances, then I tell them, you know, I'm going to make good on what I told you. I'm going to be a uh, Johnny on the spot kind of landlord. And I'm going to get on the phone. And if I need to find a plumber, an electrician, an AC guy, I will do that. And I won't, I won't uh, 
you know, I, I want to make good on my promise sure. and get this resolved for you. So um, I just will get on Craigslist, Yelp, uh, try to find somebody who sounds like they're a, a decent service provider and I line them up and then I tell my tenant, hey, I can have somebody by there tomorrow morning to resolve whatever issue that they have. And I tell that contractor, you know, please communicate with me. Please don't uh, do any unauthorized work. Please understand I'm the one paying you. Right. And then I just make myself available to get those calls. Right. From the AC tech or whomever. Uh, so yeah. I, I guess selfishly, I haven't wanted to uh, use a management company. I thought, well, heck, I can call a plumber. I can call an AC company. And, 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 I, and I haven't leaned on a management company to collect rents or anything like that. My tenants just pay me, uh, you right. know, the old fashioned way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, early on, it was always a check. Now with Google Pay and and Zelle and Venmo. Yeah, uh, there's a thousand ways to pay somebody for rent. Well, in in you're actually, I would say, smart. You are hands on. I mean, you, you think about the average management fee today is between eight and ten percent. Multiply that times twelve properties times twelve months out of the year. You know, you, you could probably save up a nice little nest egg for those unexpected maintenance issues that invariably will come up over time. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, I, I definitely um, kind of envy that hands-on approach. So. Um, well, and I think, I think, I think as, as we, you know, uh, had a conversation here, I guess maybe the takeaway is either approach can work. And so you, you, uh, one doesn't spell success and the other one, uh, a disastrous result, uh, either formula can, can be, uh, workable. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's, there's trade-offs to both approaches. There's upside, there's pluses and minuses to either approach. Yeah. Now keeping with kind of that, that financial, uh, strategy and, and mindset to managing your properties, what other, um, you know, strategies have you kind of, used um with with you know once you take the the profit from the cash flow what do you go and do with that cash flow do you, do you use it to to pay your your personal bills do you roll it back into the company do you use it for mortgage pay down or do you use it simply for you know going on a nice vacation with your family sure i'm not um i guess i'm not as disciplined as i should be and so I think the answer, an honest answer, Damon, is all the above. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I've learned over the years that hey, please remember that uh, property taxes. You do not want to uh, be asleep at the wheel and forget that. Oh yes, property taxes are due every year. So because um, I I. Uh, you know, if, if you pulled my credit report, you'd see all those mortgage loans that I have in my name. And I don't escrow for uh, uh, taxes and insurance. And so I've become, I, you know, I, I, every time I get a rent check, I realize, hey, listen, um, you know, while uh, this may look like decent cash flow, I need to understand that I'm going to have a significant tax bill to pay every year. And, uh, you know, the tax bill on 12 properties, the property tax bill uh, is pretty substantial. And so I try to, um, you know, uh, show some, some, some um, self-control, some prudence in that, hey, uh, it's nice that I can cover that mortgage and I've got some cash flow, but I have to bear those expenses in mind uh, so I don't have a rude awakening to, to realize at the end of the year, I don't have enough to, to pay the property taxes on, on all my properties. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but yes, my, I, I do have a separate 
uh, account that my that my rent checks go into. I pay expenses out of that account. Um, but it is nice to, uh, to also have the flexibility to say, hey, um, I think we could enjoy a little bit, uh, you know, if we, if, if my family and I, uh, you know, have planned and thought about a, a family trip, you know, a modest family trip somewhere, it's nice to know, hey, if, if I needed to pull money out of, out of that uh, account, uh, later to be reimbursed, uh, that's certainly up to our discretion to do so. Sure. That's great. Um, okay. So we're, we're coming up, um, you know, just looking at the, the clock here, I want to be mindful of your time. Um, but, you know, you know, a lot of our audience is, you know, just getting started. Some of them may only have one property or a few properties, in your 25 years of experience, you know, what are some, some golden nuggets that you want our audience to walk away with? Sure. Um, I think, um, and, and this is really um, nice that there are so many different ways you can educate yourself. You can consume so much information um, by just getting on your laptop and, and, uh, finding those good resources, those platforms where people uh, of all walks of life, beginners, seasoned realtors, I mean, seasoned investors, individuals like you, Damon, and, and uh, it, it sure seems like people are willing to share their experiences, their know-how, um, and, and uh, not ask for anything in return. So I think one golden nugget is you don't have to go out there. In fact, I, I if you asked me personally, I would say, uh, you know, save your money. Uh, don't, don't spend it on expensive, um, you know, um, systems. Uh, you, can, you can certainly give yourself a good education without having to part with a lot of money. Sure. Or if you do decide to invest your money, do the research and, and before you just needlessly spend hard-earned dollars on real estate content. Yeah. Um, and um, you can educate yourself that way. And I certainly have done that over the years. Uh, so the internet can be a wealth of information to prepare you to take that first step. Um, and then, you know, much like my personal uh, journey, um, you know, I, I took the approach, here goes nothing. I don't know it all, but that's okay. Um, I'm, I will never know it all. And I, I took that leap of faith. I think, um, however, I did realize, okay, if this turns out to be a colossal mistake for whatever reason, if it, if it um, keeps me up at night to where I can't sleep, if yeah. it strains my marriage, if it demands too much of my time, if, if any of those things occur, uh, have an exit strategy. You know, if you dab, if you dip your toe in real estate and realize this isn't my cup of tea, it's not for everybody. If you think this is for the birds, well then, at least you you um, you you attempted. You you didn't let your fear paralyze you into not giving it a shot. And uh, and either one of two things is going to happen. You're going to re either realize that you really like this and you'd like to keep at it, or you might realize, you know what? Um, I thought this was going to be something that would wake up a real um, zeal in me. And if it doesn't do that, that's not failure. That's just, hey, you tried something. I, maybe a good example would be, uh, you know, if you have children and one of them wants to uh, take up an instrument, they may take up an instrument and, and fall in love with that instrument and realize that music is in their DNA. And then they also might realize, you know what? I tried this wind instrument or the drums or something and uh, I'm just not, I don't have this passion that I thought I might have. Right. So you can try it and you can have an exit strategy 
and dip your toe in it and see what the future holds for you. Uh, and you don't have to, you don't, you certainly don't have to know it all. I'm the <laughs> best example of that. Uh, but you can, you can certainly uh, dip your toe in it and see, see where it leads you. And then uh, maybe, you know, this is just good for any life lesson. Uh, learn to laugh at yourself, learn to laugh at your mistakes. Uh, because um, life is a journey and it's not about uh, not making mistakes. It's about, you know, how do you react to those? Yeah. And, and can you, um, can you learn? Can you grow? You certainly can. Um, will you continue to um, fall down? Of course, uh, that's just, that's just life. But um, that's the journey I've been on. And I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I hope, uh, you know, uh, it can continue, uh, God willing, it will. And, uh, well, and, and I'm doing it. Um, you know, there's always the selfish side of it. Why am I doing this? Sure. Having extra money, uh, building some wealth would be, it is awesome. Um, but I'd also like to maybe leave a legacy to my two daughters. Sure. And, uh, maybe give them some some options that they may not have otherwise. Well, that's great, James. I mean, you know, certainly in 25 years, you've, you've, I'm sure seen a lot. You've made uh, many mistakes as we all have, and you've learned from those mistakes, but it sounds like you, you never let those, uh, those challenges get in your way of success and building wealth and thinking about, you know, your family and your children and, and creating a legacy for, uh, you know, something that you could pass on to, to, uh, to your children. So um, I love hearing stories about, um, you know, the, the sage advice that uh, some, some folks that have 25 years of experience can, uh, can, can give the, the rest of us. So um, it's always great to hear from experienced investors that have been there and done that. And I want to thank you for coming on the Stacking Houses podcast. And if our listeners want to find out uh, if they want to connect with you, where can they find you online? Well, I don't, I don't have much of a social media uh, footprint, oddly <laughs> enough. Uh, but they could certainly just email me, um, at, you know, use me as a sounding board. If they have dumb questions, um, I, I'd love to uh, to, to, to be the first to say, oh my gosh, that's not a dumb question. It's actually brilliant. And here's my two cents worth. So my, uh, my email address is just the word email followed by my last name. So email ledbetter at gmail.com and happy to be a, a free um, second opinion or, or someone who could maybe give you an answer that might uh, make that light bulb go off in your head and, and help you uh, uh, continue down this journey. Yeah. Um, and, and you're on bigger pockets as well, too. I mean, that, that might be a place where you can connect, uh, you know, online as well, correct? Very true. Very true. Yeah. Very true. But yeah, Damon, I, I consider this time well spent. Can't thank you enough um, for the opportunity just to talk real estate. It's always fun. I, ne I never get tired of it and uh, um, uh, happy to do this anytime, anytime. All right. Well, House Stackers, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, our goal is to provide you with incredible value. So for today's episode, I want to give you a free copy of my book entitled How to Acquire Your First 10 Investment Properties. And you can pick this up simply by going to stackinghouses.com forward slash book. And until next time, this is Damon with stackinghouses.com and happy investing to you. Thank you again. <laughs>